Welcome folks to a beautiful sunny autumn day. Now I'm on Trotters Lake at Holly Farm, a local venue to me, and this is a classic mixed style fishery. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of carp in the lake in front of me. I'm hoping to catch loads of them today, but to fill in the gaps, we've got roach, skimmers, a few tench, maybe the odd cruising carp. Plenty of bites is the name of the game today. So what I would like to show you guys is a method that I think is a great way of catch, catching fish, getting bites when the water temperatures drop. We've had quite a few frosts now. The frost this morning, the sun being out now is a little bit deceiving. It's a lovely day now, but this morning it was absolutely freezing cold. And whereas you're getting water temperatures of around maybe 20 degrees in the summer months, the water temperatures have dropped to probably half of that now. So those carp are a little bit more lethargic. They're not feeding as aggressively. What we want to do is fish with baits that are going to target those other fish. So I'm trying to be a little bit clever. I know that throughout the summer months, these fish are targeted with corn, pellets, meat, those sort of baits. The fish sort of see them as staple baits, but I don't know if they get overly excited by those baits once they've been caught on them a few times throughout the year. So what I want to do is fish with more natural baits. Today's going to be all about casters, worms, and then some ground bait. I'm going to use the ground bait purely as an attractor, and the worms and the casters are going to be what I feed as my sort of like meaty baits that I'm going to put on the hook. They're my target baits. So what I'm really keen to do, put some bait in the swim. I've had a plumb up. I'm only going to fish short range today. I've plumbed up a line at six meters out. Classic area on a lot of commercial fisheries, just down that slope. And what I'm going to do is take it easy with my feed. I'm going to feed one ball of ground bait to start with. So I'm really cautious that the, the peg could start fizzing. So I don't really want to feed loads and loads of bait. I've mixed this ground bait up before I left this morning. So it's got loads of water in. This is the Swim Stim Cool Water Green Mix. Got plenty of fish meal in. Don't get me wrong, these fish still want fish meal. So I'm just going to make a ball. I've got my marker. I'm just going to drop a ball in. And that is the start of our session. We've not put any bait in yet. That's the, literally the start of our session. Because what I want to do is just work out the best way of feeding the peg. It might be that we're dropping a ball in, catching two or three fish and we're having to top up again. Or it might be we're loose feeding over the top. Now, bait-wise, as I say, I've got a couple of pints of casters and I've got some worms in there. These are dendrobina worms. Willy Worms Finest dendrobinas. And what I should be doing is fishing bits of worm on the hook, or we might be chopping a few of these and feeding a few in those balls of ground bait. I don't envisage that we'll be chopping the worms overly finely because we do want to target some quality fish, so we want to give the fish a little bit of something to chew on. Let's talk about rigs because I've got two different rigs set up. We'll talk about We'll talk about the, the heavier one first, because let's try and think a little bit on the positive side. So we're going to start at the elastic end. Yellow reactor core. We're targeting carp on this line, but we also want to have enough stretch there, enough sort of give if we hook those skimmers or those, those quality fish. This is going to be my quality fish rig. And the size of float reflects that. It's a 4x14. This is a, a midi carp blue nice bulbous shape to it, sits there nice in the water, 1.5 mil hollow bristle, bendy wire stem, you know, classic steel water style shape. We've got 016 main line, and then we've got a strung out, just to start with, just to, before we work out what's going on in the swim, a strung out shotting pattern of number 10s, and they're in the bottom sort of quarter of the rig, just to keep everything nice and stable down there. The hook length is 012. I've got my last number 10 on the hook length because I'm using an 8 inch hook length. And I can move, obviously because this is slot shot, we're not going to damage the line if we uh, move, that, move that number 10 up and down that hook length. We can move that up and down depending on what we're doing because I might be laying sort of like four or five inch of line on the bottom today, waiting for a big fish to come along and, and suck in a big bit of worm. That's the reason I'm using that 18 inch hook length and then placing that last shot on the hook length so we can tailor the rig. The hook's a size 16, 
fibrous, obviously for fishery rules. And as I say, nice soft burr, it'll power up that elastic yellow reactor core. Now let's go on to our rig that's a little bit of a, we've got what we'd like to call the ligger rig, which is just sitting there waiting for a big fish to come along. And this is our fatty rig. So this is our rig that will probably fish a little bit more through the water. And if there's a load of roach around, this is the one we'll probably, we'll probably use. So the elastic reflects that. A pink reactor core, which is the next step down from a yellow. It's probably the equivalent to maybe a number eight, something like that. Again, we're using 016 main line. We've got same style of float. This time it's a four by 12s. We want less shot down the line. It's obviously for a slower fall. We've got the same sort of shotting pattern, but it's just slightly more spread out. These are number 10s. Just slightly more spread out, just to get a slower fall through the water. We all know that roach might be a little bit more on the drop. So that's just gonna give us a bit of a slower fall through the water. This time the hook length is 010, and the hook's a size 18, which obviously reflects the baits we might be fishing on this rig. Little bits of worm, maybe single double caster, that sort of thing. So we've got two rigs, we've fed some bait, as always, I like to start with the heavy rig, just in case a carp's come into the swim, or if we can catch those smaller fish on the heavy rig, we'll probably won't even need to pick up this lighter rig. So bait-wise, I think a good start would be nice bit of worm. Just gonna go with a single bit of worm. There we go. Nice long bit of worm, probably inch and a half long. I've just nipped the head off. And let's see what's come to that bait. Now this heavier rig, to start with, I've set it an inch over depth just to see what happens to start with. So when I was plumbing up, I was ever so careful to just set that rig an inch over depth. Now this is a sort of scaled down approach to how I would maybe fish a margin in the summer months. So dumping in ground bait, fishing big baits over the top is a brilliant way of catching those fish in the summer months where you're fishing in the margins, maybe in two foot of water when those fish are coming into shallow water. But at this time of year, when those fish just drop a little bit deeper, they're still going to want to feed. You know, temperatures aren't rock bottom yet. So those fish will still feed. They just need a little bit more uh, coaxing to come onto the feed. I know that they have quite a few matches on this venue, so I've been told that there's plenty of bream being caught at the minute, loads of skimmers, some quality roach as well. I fished a match three or four weeks ago on, on one of the other lakes where there was a lot of silverfish, but they all seem to be of a pretty small stamp. But I'm sure on this lake, the fish are, are slightly bigger and you should be catching some quality fish rather than a lot of tiny fish. But you never know, you never know how this approach is going to go. Like I say, it might be a case of dumping ground bait, sitting and waiting for quality fish, or it might be a case of loose feeding casters over the top. There we go, first fish of the day. Probably took five or so minutes for us to get a bite, but no liners. And then just a little dip on the float and we've got a fish. And he's a lovely little, lovely little carp. I wouldn't mind catching these every, every chuck today. Let's hold him up for you. There we go, lovely little carp style, it's probably a pound and a half, something like that. Now there's plenty of bigger fish in here, so. We'll hopefully catch a few bigger ones, but I think as a start, that's a great start. Now what I'm not gonna do is feed again. I was just picking up my pole pot then as a force of habit, because I do like to set a trap and feed for each individual fish but I 
think because we've fed quite a lot of bait at the start, that ball of ground bait is, you know, there's enough bait there to keep a few fish happy. We'll put the rig in again, just see how many fish we can catch off one feed. I mean, if we don't get a bite now for a while, we might have to feed again, but I think it'll be a case of maybe catching two, three, four fish off, off one amount of feed and then repeating the process again. I'm really happy how that went. It was literally no indications on the float at all for three or four minutes and then perfect bite and we've, we've caught our first fish. So if the session carries on like that all day, I'll be more than happy. You can probably see I'm not lifting and dropping the float all the time. I'm just keeping everything nice and still right over where we've put that ball of ground bait. You can just see occasionally a little clip or a little fizz where that ball of ground bait settled. So we know we're right on the bait. We're trying to be as accurate as possible. We just keep everything nice and still and hopefully we keep our peg nice and relaxed and just one or two fish come in and slowly hoover up that ground bait and then pick my worm up at the same time. I think there's plenty of those little carp in this lake, but I didn't realise there'd be a... Oh God, another one. This is, this is a brilliant start. This feels a bigger fish. This is definitely a bigger fish. And this is why I'm so pleased that we started on, on the heavier of the two rigs because when you do hook a bigger fish, it just gives you a chance. Obviously, if we'd have started on the light rig, you just don't get a, just don't get a chance really of landing these, landing these early fish, these, these fish that can set you up for the, the session. Another benefit of starting on a heavier rig is it gives you somewhere to go. If we'd have put the light rig in and then not had a bite, we'd have been worrying, but at least if we hadn't have had a bite on this heavier rig, it gives us somewhere to go and we could have put the light rig in and, and messed around with that light rig with different presentations. But more importantly, it's getting these bigger fish out. Quite a beautiful fish. As a few people will know, I used to fish this venue 15, 20 years ago. I used to, I used to fish a hell of a lot of matches on this venue and We used to catch two and three pound common carp that were fantastic fish. You could catch on meta feeders to the far bank and there was a massive influx of them in this in this lake and it was a brilliant period for two or three years. Fish after fish it was, chucking a meta feeder up up against the mud on the far side. And this looks like a an old warrior common might even be one of those fish that we used to catch three years ago I don't really want to rush never really rush my fish early on in a session especially with a decent a decent fish which this seems this seems to be
let me tell you, considering the water temperature is pretty cold, he's still putting up a scrap, this fella is. Got to be this time. Oh. <laughs> Schoolboy nesting that was. Terrible. There we go. He's in the net. Oh, it feels heavy, such a heavy fish for his size. He's rock solid, that's why he's put up a fight. Absolutely rock solid. I think that is a brilliant start. Two fish and two drops. One new stocky and one fish that is probably one of those fish that I used to catch years ago. Cracking star. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a bit more feed in. I'm going to put another ball of ground back in because you could see when I hooked that fish, there was bubbles, there was obviously everything was displaced down there. And I still want to keep that trap approach. So I'm going to put another ball in, set a trap again, see if we can repeat the process. So you could probably see that time, I didn't feed as much ground bait as I did in that initial feed. That initial feed was to get some fish there and what I'm doing now is just topping up with a view to attracting just one or two fish. Don't want millions of fish down there, I just want one or two fish down there. Enough fish for one of them to make a mistake. And I'm getting a pretty good response well, those first two fish gave me a pretty good response, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with just feeding a slightly smaller bull and seeing how it goes. Now, the other thing that I've done, I'm not using such a, such as big a bit of worm. As yet, we've had two drops in, we've had two proper fish. No other little bites, no other indications that tell me there's a lot of nuisance fish around. So I can get away with just a slightly smaller bit of worm And I think that's just a little bit more appealing to, especially those sort of stocky fish, those pound, pound and halfers. Obviously a bigger fish is still going to pick it up anyway, but small bit of worms, hopefully just going to get us a few more bites. Again, I'm keeping the rig nice and still. It's a beautiful day today, there's no wind at all, so there's no tow or drift on the rig, so I can keep everything nice and still. And it's a brilliant way of fishing, a really nice relaxed way of fishing, whereas maybe with other baits, you know, particle style baits, pellets, corn and, and meat, you're having to strike at little tiny dibs and your reactions have got to be super sharp. With a bit of worm, Fish tend to grab onto it a little bit and suck it in and you've just got that extra extra second or so before the fish spits it out because he likes to have a nice taste of it and a bit of a chew on it before he realises that realises there's a hook involved. So again, we're waiting for bites. I imagine we're gonna get one relatively soon. Oh, missed that one. That was a slow liner. Probably shouldn't have struck at that one. I always think it's amazing how 
your feed the bait dictates what fish come into your swim. So if we'd have fed a lot of maybe loose fed casters over the top, we'd have probably had issues with smaller fish intercepting the bait on the way down. But because we've just fed one ball of ground bait, it's gone to the bottom, it's almost sneaked the bait in away from any smaller fish. You've got a great chance of attracting some quality fish into the swim. Well, let me tell you folks, it took an age to get that bite. And it wasn't for the lack of indications. I mean, look at that for a beautiful little carp. They've either spawned in here or some fresh fish have been stocked. We ha we've had a load of indications obviously the fish are going mad to get to that ground bait so i don't really want them eating the ground bait i want them eating what's on my hook and i think we need to rethink the feeding a little bit so i just need to calm calm the peg down so this time I'm just going to feed, I'm just putting in a few worms in the pot. I'm going to give them a few snips. I want them sort of the same size as my hook bait. Remember we're targeting decent fish so I want them sort of the same size as my hook bait. A few casters in the pot, not many, just a few. And that's what's, that's what's going to be my feed so I'm trying to cut out the ground bait. I think they've just gone crazy for it, if I'm honest. We'll drop that in. Again, I think, obviously the fish don't mind eating worms. And now we're feeding a few more. Hopefully they'll They'll pick up that worm hook bait a little bit better. But the amount of bubbles that we've had in the swim and line bites and lifts on the float has shown that there's obviously plenty of fish around. If this doesn't work, it might be worth trying to find maybe some harder bottom somewhere where we can present a rig better and the fish aren't digging their heads into the silt constantly trying to hunt out your bait. But we'll see how this goes. Again, we're not feeding loads and loads of bait, we're just trying to attract one or two fish. I mean, this, that ground bait must be so potent. The, the fish were going mad for it. There we go, that's a bite. But just changing the feeding has made a difference straight away. We've gone from a million indications and waiting ages for a proper bite to a bite within 20 or 30 seconds. Still think it's important to try and sneak the bait in with the pot. What is it? The little, the little F1. I think it's important to just wrap it all nice F1. Probably 
say, what is it? Pound and a half, something like that. So I think it's really important to sneak the bait in rather than throwing the bait in. We could probably chuck a few casters in over the top, but I think that's just, just gonna make the line bite situation worse. So we'll carry on doing what we're doing. We'll repeat that process, not as many worms this time. Maybe this is the, the winning combination. So five or six worms chopped up and 20 or so casters in the pot. Sneak them in. And again, you could say, why are you potting them in? You could be using a, a little pole mounted pot and make everything happen a little bit faster. But I always feel that if you fish too fast, you run the risk of getting line bites and, and foul, hook, foul hook fish. So by using this bigger pot, it forces me to slow down a little bit. So that loose feed that I've just fed is now falling through the water. It's probably only just reached the bottom. And that's where we're gonna present our hook bait. The last thing I want to do is ship out, rattling some bait up from a pole mounted pot the fish get all excited and then at half depth, they intercept the falling bait and I get a line bite and strike into a, into a fish and foul hook it. Hopefully now everything's calmed down, it's on the bottom and I can lower my rigging in amongst that feed, a little indication straight away. It's all about getting the right sort of indications. Well, folks, not everything's going to plan. We're catching fish, don't get me wrong, we've had a couple of skimmers now, a couple more carp, but we're just getting way too many indications and there's bubbles, it's fizzing, and it's obvious that there's plenty of fish feeding and I'm fishing in the wrong place. So what I've done is I've come back a section of pole, I've re-plumbed up, altered the rig, slightly shallower, it's only probably three inch shallower, but that tells me that we're just coming out of that soft bottom out of the silt and i think it's that silt which is causing us the problems obviously when there's some bait on the bottom smaller baits generally this is a problem with so micro pellets ground bait smaller baits fish are digging in that silt and the ripping up the bottom it becomes basically pitch black down there don't get me wrong the carp love feeding in silt but it makes it almost impossible for them to find you know our hook bait in amongst all that cloud of silt so what i've done is i've come back in theory, the bottom should be a little bit harder. Like I say, re-plumbed up. It's easy to find silt if you're looking, if you're plumbing up and using a nice heavy plummet. So I use a 30 gram plummet. And when you're looking for that hard bottom, what you need to do is lower the plummet in quite aggressively, let it zoom to the bottom. And then as you lift the plummet away from the bottom, it will stick, it will stick in the silt. So gently lift up the plummet, it will stick in any silt that's there. And that tells you the bottom's really soft. And all I've done is I've come back until the, the plummet stops sticking in the bottom, found a harder bit of lake bed, and in theory we should get better bites, more fish. Like I said, it's not about getting as many indications as we can, we want to get the right sort of indications. So hopefully this is the way forward. I've kick-started the swim with a little ball of ground bait, a few chop worms and a few casters. Not a lot of bait, we don't want to make the same mistakes as we made initially. And let's get it right, we're only pulling those fish that are settled on our six metre line, we're just pulling them back a, a metre or so to our five metre line now. So those fish should be able to, to move that short distance, we're not trying to attract fish from a long way away. Might take a little while just to get this swim going, but I definitely think it's the right decision to make. And Quite often, it's all about your decision making during a, during a session, which makes the difference between catching a net full of fish and just ending up being frustrated throughout the day. So I'm hoping it's the right choice to make, the right decision to make.
We'd caught a couple of skimmers just before I moved and they are notorious for feeding in the deeper part of the, the swim, so they don't mind feeding over silt. And I didn't want to come too far back and risk not having a chance of catching those. There we go, it didn't take long, did it? First fish on the shorter line. There we go, skim off. Just as I was talking about skimmers, we've got one. So that's shown that we're still in the sort of right area to catch a few fish. I mean, in a match, they are proper weight builders. A pound every time you, you, you ship your pole out and they hardly fight. So nice and easy to catch, skimmers are. What I don't want to do is top up with ground mate because I'm hopefully saving that ground bait for if the peg dies on me a little bit because that was that was obviously what the fish really wanted. I'm just going to top up with worms and casters again. If there's loads of skimmers there, we might end up catching quite a few off just a really small amount of feed, but I'm still really keen to catch some carp, especially after those early early few carp that we had. And that is the beauty of this, this method, that it fills in all the gaps. So we could sit here with a massive bait on, hoping that we get towed under by a big carp every now and again. But in those quiet spells, we can fill the gaps with maybe some smaller carp, some skimmers, some other fish. And there's obviously plenty of other fish in, well, I'd guess nearly every single lake in the country, there's plenty of other fish in there that are worth catching. Not just all about carp. And if we can just come back with a decent sized fish every, every drop in, That would cheer me up no end. What could this be? <laughs> a little cru little cruising. Look at that. Look at that. Beautiful little fish. Look at that. Cracking little fish. I knew there was a few cruisers in here. Definitely shows this short line isn't wasn't the wrong choice. A few more worms. I mean if I was fishing if I was fishing a competition I'd probably have the worms already chopped, but for you guys, I just want to show how fine I'm chopping them. Just trying a different bait as well also, so I've got still a full worm, but we're just nipping it in two, so my thinking behind that is there's more gooey bits exposed, more juice exposed, and if the bottom is getting kicked up down there and sight's an issue, smell might come into it a little bit more and they might be able to just sniff the, the juices out a little bit better. That's the theory anyway. Definitely less action on in this swim as in bubbles and and line bites. Already I can tell that It's a lot easier to fish this swim than it was that longer swim. And it just shows that 
if you give the fish the right baits, you can still catch them relatively close in. The amount of silverfish matches that I've fished in the winter time and ended up catching a rake of carp at five meters after feeding casters and worms is ridiculous. And obviously in the carp matches that you fish, you end up fishing 16 meters or, or 14 and a half meters on a long pole, feeding a few pellets. So if you give them a, a bait that they really want, they'll come to you, no doubt about it. So every time I put the rig into the swim, I'm just trying to lower the last sort of like eight or 10 inch into the swim. I think that just straightens the rig out. It just means that you're fishing a little bit faster as well. You can zoom the rig down and then you can straighten, straighten the last eight or 10 inches out, which is the important part of the rig. Another skimmer. This is what we were hoping for today. Net full of these. See if we can catch another fish off, the, off that feed. See if we can get a couple of fish. Two bits of worm, nip the head off, hook the open end. And hopefully you can see that the method is is relatively easy, but it's the decision making of where to fish and when to swap lines and what you do with your feeding that, that makes the difference. And it does make a massive difference. You see a lot of really top anglers in there. They're moving swims, they make them decisions just a, a few fish earlier than everyone else. And that's, that's what wins them the matches at the end of the day. Definitely a few fish moved in on that feed. I'm not, I'm keen to try and keep feeding to a minimum because I don't want the peg to go uh, a little bit all over the place with foul hookers and line bites. So I'm really keen to keep my feeding nice and calm. Look at that, it's a cracking, cracking skimmer. Bigger than a couple of the carp I've had. There you go. Beautiful fish. Let's keep going. Let's see how many we can catch without feeding. So that's two fish. I think we might be able to get to three or four before we need to feed again. Still on the heavier of the, the two rigs. I think that's the rig I'll end up staying on as well. These fish don't seem to don't seem to mind it. It's a totally different swim this is now. Just coming that meter back made a massive difference. No bubbles. A few line bites, but that's a nice sign as long as they're not constant. But no bubbles. <laughs> three and three. Little F1 look. Look at the back on him. Got a right hump, humpy back. We're catching a right mixed bag, let me tell you. Three and three after that feed. It's amazing how they hang around for for these bait, these little baits. I think we're pushing it now.
amazing how many fish you can catch off off one feed. Obviously, that ground bait's still hanging around. This this feels like another cruising, you know. A ground bait's still hanging around. There it is, little cruising. I think we're going to feed a bit more bait because we do want to be catching some quality fish. It just shows this new line has made all the difference. Try two bigger bits of worm as well, see if we can catch something a little bit bigger. I'm just nipping the head off two worms. Two bigger bits there. Let's see if we can maybe catch a carp. I think one of those bigger skimmers will eat that as well. There we go, better fish. Bigger bait, better fish. Classic reel, isn't it? Straight after a loose feed. Looks like a little carp, one of those stockies again. Beautiful fishing this is. You cannot get better than this. You don't know what you're gonna hook every, every put in or catch in. Beautiful fish. It's a fish every drop in now. Let's see what happens if we do that again. So, two nice big bits of worm. We've only been fishing for maybe, I don't know, 45 minutes, an hour. But we've had a brilliant workout for the worms and the ground bait. We've made a couple of key decisions that I think are really going to pay off. And I'm hoping it's going to carry on for the rest of the session. I'm hope I'm well. I'm guessing this can only get stronger. This line can. Generally, when you start catching short, it only gets stronger. Well, folks, we have had a brilliant day's fishing. We've had a bite. Every time we've put the rig in the water, which you can't ask, you can't ask for much more than that. We've had some carp, we've had some decent carp as well. We've had skimmers, we've had some F1s, we've had some ghosty looking F1s, little sort of eight ounce ghosty looking F1s. And we've had those beautiful little cruisers as well. We've had probably half a dozen of those little cruising carp. And like I say, I think we've made some fantastic decisions today. It's not often I get everything right or anything right, but I think moving, moving swim was important. Another little, well, cracking little F1 that is. I think moving swim was really important. So 
coming back on that harder lake bed. But from the start, we've obviously done things a little bit different. We fished a bait where I can't imagine these fish in that. You'd be happy with that anywhere. I can't imagine these fish have been caught in this way for quite a while. So we're giving these fish something a little bit different and they've obviously lapped it up. They went absolutely crazy on that ground bait. And although I fed it again, the peg just went a little bit quiet. So I fed a little ball of ground bait and it, it definitely brought some fish back. We'd stuck to feeding just those worms and some casters. And we've not fed loads of bait. We've probably fed, I don't know, maybe a quarter of a kilo of worms. Half a pint of casters, maybe. But because we've we've potted the bait in, we've kept it really tight. We've got the bait to the bottom. We've not attracted loads of small fish, and we've kept some quality fish in the peg. Another carp. This is another another nice carp by the looks of it. There's a bit of a plodder this one, rather than darting around. And it's often the case, if you can pot, pot your bait in and sort of sneak it in, into the swim, you don't have to feed a lot of bait. I liken it to, to feeder fishing. Quite often you're not feeding much bait when you feed a fishing because you're relying on that feeder to get your bait to the bottom and, and attract your fish to, to your hook bait. And it's gone to show that by fishing a bait that appeals to sort of everything in the lake, you just fill in those gaps. You just never sit there without, without getting bites. We've had fish today from probably six ounce up to six or seven pounds. And half the fun, as I said earlier, is when you do get a bite, you just don't know what it's going to be from. I've got a rough idea. We've worked a few things out. So straight after... Oh, missed him again. Straight after feeding is a great time to maybe catch a, a bigger fish. And then maybe after you've caught your bigger fish, you're, you're scaling down your hook baits catch some smaller fish but I think this carp is ample proof of the power of the worm and I think he is an ideal way to finish. If you enjoyed the video think about subscribing it helps me out massively. Until next time, tight lines.